2003 Toyota Tacoma two-door pre-runner standard cab LB available, $2,700. The color is red, all the windows work, the flatbed is nice, it's great condition, we'd love to hear from you. Am I selling my truck? Or am I speaking in code telling you that you're listening to a new episode of Go Chuck Yourself? I don't know, you be the judge. But this is an episode of Go Chuck Yourself and we will be discussing Chuck versus the Living Dead, so... I guess, I don't know, that's kind of the answer. Before we start, I just wanted to let you know that you can tweet at us at GoChuckPodcast, or you can email us at GoChuckYourselfPodcast at gmail.com, especially if you want to buy my truck. Please, please buy my truck. This isn't a joke. Stephen Bartowski because we're back that's right it's go (laughs) chuck yourself and today we are gathered to discuss season three episode 17 chuck versus the living dead more like chuck versus the living dad am i right oh you are right too bad this wasn't our father's day episode we keep missing it by like just one one or two yeah we have very bad luck when it comes to father's day we yeah. usually father's day comes and goes we usually record on father's day because we're terrible children <laughs> and uh then the next week we have an episode that prominently features a father figure so and if you think about it like we've, four. we've discussed in the past that like our primary listeners are dads like our dads and then other people's dads so in a way we are taking other children's fathers from them so that they will listen to chuck but we are not properly honoring them. Right. Well, I mean, maybe... Okay, so this episode's going to come out in July 2020. If you want, I'll let you pause it right now. Save it until Father's Day 2021. We'll not be offended. I'm going to stop. Would these episodes have aired on Father's Day 2012 or whenever this was? No, it wouldn't be 2012. It wouldn't have been 2012, but... 20, uh, 2009? 10? 10? Um, I don't I mean, think it, so. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. That would be like, that would be a harsh blow for this. I mean, this one is okay, but like the Stevens return, I feel like is setting up for disaster. Well, I too feel like we're setting up for disaster in this episode (laughs) of Chuck. By the way, let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Gillespie. I am one of the uh, hosts of this fine podcast. My name is Aaron Arada, and I am also one of the hosts of this this (laughs) podcast. I I wouldn't call it fine. Uh, So... Chuck vs. the Living Dead originally aired on May 17th, 2010. Okay, and when was Father's Day on in 2010? Well, it's never in May, so it definitely didn't air on Father's <laughs> Day, but it could have aired on Mother's Day, so I guess we can find out. Uh, Mother's Day 2010 was... Uh, oh, well, the film Mother's Day came out in 2010, <laughs> but that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, when, when was the day? When was Mother's Day? Stop. Uh, it was on May 9th. So Okay, so the week before this. Yeah. Uh, that is all the information you need to know about Chuck versus the Living Dead. <laughs> yes. I'm going to definitely, I intentionally said it before, but I will probably slip up and also just call this episode Chuck versus the Living Dad unintentionally. So please forgive me as we go journey through this episode. Uh, as we had mentioned, this episode features the return of the character of Stephen Bartowski, the father of of Chuck and Ellie Bartowski. He is played by the actor who I I seriously don't think it's a coincidence that they named this episode The Living Dead <laughs> and this actor is in it. Uh, his first name is Scott. And if you're a, a, a regular listener to this program, you know that his last name is, I suspect, so terrifying that I, I shudder to mention it on air. So we're just going to be referring to him as, as Scott. Ah <laughs> oh, man, Chris, I was I was getting ready to do like an evil laugh. I was yeah, ready. You... I was trying to figure out how how one such as Scott might laugh if he were uh, evil. Uh, do you want? I'll brace myself if you want to say his last name. It's Bacula. But but is it or is it Dracula? Ah! 
He's the living dead. That's what it is. He's the vampire. He's he's neither living nor dead. He's the unholy ground between the two. He plays a significant part in the film Forgetting Sarah Marshall, which may have also come out in 2010. Did he really? Well, I mean, Scott Bakula doesn't, but Dracula does. Ah! Stop I'm sorry. saying I'm sorry. that, Aaron. I'm sorry. Jeez. <sighs> you you should have. Uh, uh, something that you might not know, since this is an audio medium, is that Chris is currently wearing several crucifixes and is holding just. He's holding two, like, huge. I don't even know how he got that much garlic, but he's holding two huge things of garlic. I am. And I would like to add that this is especially dangerous on my end because I have a sensitivity to garlic, <laughs> but I am. I have a stronger sensitivity to vampires. So for that reason, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Garlic <laughs> is now my friend. Yep. So uh, Chris is prepared. I um, I'm I've always been uh, of the firm belief that if, if a vampire wants me, I'm I'm into that. Just come here. You're invited, friends. Open invitation. Aaron is a part of uh, what we refer to as the Twilight Generation. Yes, that is me. So uh, I'm going to invite specifically, I'm going to invite Scott Bakula into my home, like uh, or Scott Dracula, either one, both. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, just clutch, clutch your clutch your garlic necklace, Chris, and I will uh, lead us through the episode, hopefully uh, coming out safely on the other side. OK, I trust you, but also I don't. So uh, as Chris said, we're in for an exciting one this time because the episode starts with a cabin in the middle of nowhere, though knowing Chuck, it's probably actually in Southern California somewhere. But it's specifically the cabin that that one guy lived in, in uh, Chuck versus the Tic Tac. Is where it? Casey, Casey killed that guy. It's the exact same cabin. <laughs> okay, I didn't notice that, but that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so either uh, Stephen just moved in or they just uh, didn't have a huge cabin budget this this year. Who should be at that cabin but one Scott Bakula, a.k.a. Chuck and Ellie's dad, Stephen. Stephen receives a newspaper, which I don't usually know if paperboys, like, knock on your door, but uh, this paperboy knocks on his door and leaves a newspaper kind of, like, crumpled up on his doorstep, and he checks the classifieds, zeroing in on an ad that seems to have been a code from Ellie. He translates it as her saying she needs to see him ASAP. We cut to Devin and Ellie's, where she receives a message from Stephen via the classified ads, which she decodes as, I'll be in touch soon. As Devin makes a smoothie, she can somehow hear enough to give our friend Justin a quick call. I don't know, like, usually, like, the, the point of the blender is that Devin can't hear her, but I would also assume that she can't hear, especially, like, a really tinny voice on a phone, but apparently she can. She lets Justin know that her dad has contacted her. He tells her to meet him at the usual place, and she says she'll be there in 10 minutes. And I'm kind of wondering, like, what is she proposing to tell him here? Because Stephen didn't really give her any information. Is she just going to be like, yeah, my dad said he'll be in touch. Like, I feel like she could have said that over the phone. But, you know, it's fine. We cut to Chuck in his apartment on the phone with Morgan, which is, again, seems like a weird phone call considering they live together. But uh, I don't know where Morgan is. I thought this was going to be an episode that Morgan wasn't in, but he is in the next scene, so I don't really know what the point of this is. Other than... Chuck tells Morgan about his dream that Shaw is still alive, and Morgan asks if Chuck has told Sarah yet. As soon as Chuck gets off the phone, Sarah enters and asks what Chuck was talking about, but Chuck lies and then says he has to go. Sarah looks after him and seems confused. Later, Chuck meets Morgan in Morgan's closet office, so Morgan is here. Chuck tells Morgan that they can't tell Sarah about Shaw being alive until they're absolutely sure because, and Morgan finishes the sentence, because she has a history with him. And what do you... What do you think that means? Because, like, I get the idea that Chuck doesn't want Sarah to relive her trauma, but the way it's presented sounds kind of like Chuck is worried that Sarah is going to be like, oh, Shaw's alive? Great, I'm going to go date him again. That's not, like, what do you think is going on here? Well, I mean, Morgan certainly thinks that it's, that Shaw's life, it, like, threatens Chuck and Sarah's relationship, which... Uh, once I mean, again, like it does, does not... but not for that reason. Right. It threatens their lives, which they need to have if they're going to be in a relationship. Yeah. But it, um, yeah, it kind of, obviously there's some kind of disconnect and there's kind of a quirky Morgan interpretation of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But did Chuck tell Morgan that he killed Shaw? Oh, that's a good point. I mean, I assume that happened off screen, but we've never seen them have that discussion. Right. Yeah, I don't really know what to make of this. Yeah, it was it was weird. I feel like they could have as easily just said, like, we don't want to tell Sarah because she's going to be so scared because he tried to kill her or like right. because he knows her really well or like whatever. But instead, it's like, 
oh, she might just like up and be like, oh, that guy who tried to kill me. Yeah, he's great. But it's just like a bad it seems like a bad strategic move to not yeah. have the entire team be informed about this. Like yes. for Chuck to find out and be like, I'm going to go to Morgan and tell him about it. Like, yeah, I don't know. That doesn't seem like the best idea. Sarah's a an adult. She can handle yeah. herself. And at least they could tell Casey, like if he doesn't want to tell Sarah for whatever reason, like you should tell a spy like he can tell Morgan, too, but it shouldn't be like, Morgan, you got to help me with this. Or you tell Big Mike and Big Mike yeah. would be like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Shaw's yeah. alive. Who is Shaw? I don't yeah. know who that is. <laughs> That'd be kind of a cool scene. I'd be interested to see that. So Morgan agrees to help Chuck figure out if Shaw is really alive, but he's also pretty scared. So Chuck agrees to bring Morgan into Castle if he promises not to touch anything. Cut to Morgan putting on a bulletproof vest and picking up a bunch of guns and bazookas and stuff. He's interrupted by Sarah. So I guess Chuck just like left him down there. I don't really know what is going on there, but... Morgan's interrupted by Sarah, who asks if Chuck is up to something. Morgan waffles, but Sarah locks the door and tells him he's going to tell her exactly what's going on, and he's going to do it now. Meanwhile, Chuck is actually working. Well, he, he's at the nerd herd desk. He's not actually working, because what he's doing is uh, something involving a phone. He seems to be, like, downloading stuff from a phone to a computer, but that doesn't come up again. I don't know why he was downloading. A picture of Shaw comes up on the screen, and Casey walks by, asking if Chuck is reviewing pictures of people he killed. Casey seems proud of this and says he does it himself from time to time, which is weird, but kind of a good moment. <laughs> As Casey walks away, Morgan comes up in a huge winter coat, which is covering his bulletproof vest. I don't actually know where he would have gotten that kind of coat in L.A. because I've had a lot of trouble finding that kind of coat, but Morgan didn't have any trouble. He tells Chuck that Sarah knows about Shaw, but Chuck is distracted when he sees his dad entering the Bymore in like sort of a disguise, but not really a disguise. Mm -hmm. Chuck tells Morgan that Stephen doesn't know Chuck downloaded the Intersect 2.0, and Chuck intends to keep that a secret. Chuck greets his dad. Stephen is starting to get suspicious of why Casey would still be around if Chuck was out of the game, but Sarah comes up. And I want to talk about Sarah here, because Chuck, for all intents and purposes, is talking to a customer, and Sarah just barges into the middle of that and is just like, Shaw? So, I mean, it's kind of like... Chuck going up to Big Mike and saying Shaw's alive. Like, this customer to put, like would have to be like, who is Shaw? Why is he alive? Why does it matter? But luckily for Sarah, it's Steven, and he knows her. But, you know, still. I'm just running the scenario, like, oh, how would you react if you were at a store and you were talking to some kind of sales associate and someone barged up to them and said, so-and-so is still alive? <laughs> I would <laughs> <laughs> I guess you because your default reaction would be like, oh, that's a good thing because maybe they were sick or they were mm -hmm. in the hospital and maybe they're. But if someone's saying it with scorn, that really kind of gives you pause because yeah. you're like, why did, did these <laughs> people kill that person? Like, what is what why is are going they upset on? that he's still alive? Yeah. Uh, Steven is even more suspicious when he sees Sarah. But Chuck says that Sarah is no longer his handler as in, and is in fact now his girlfriend. He says he's out of the spy game for good and would not lie. That's something we know about Chuck. He cannot tell a lie. He loves the Eiffel Tower and he cannot tell a lie. And he's allergic to cats. And he's allergic to cats. That was what I was thinking of. Thank you. <laughs> After the credits, we get Ellie's scene with Justin. He's actually pretty charming in this scene. I was like, I see why she's like fallen under his, not under his spell, because she's not like attracted to him, but like why she believes that he is like a CIA agent. He seems like pretty like trustworthy. Yes, we know that the only person here that has the capability of using spells is one Scott. J Scott. You don't have to say it. You don't have to say it. That's OK. <sighs> okay. I know right. who you mean. Don't say I, the name. I know. I know he has access to the dark arts. I know. I know this. <laughs> so Justin brings Ellie into what appears to be a CIA facility. He shows her around and takes her into his office, which has a bunch of like I don't I don't know if you looked at these closely. Like it looks kind of like CIA diplomas. Like it was just like diplomas, but they said Central Intelligence Agency. I don't know like what that's supposed to be. Yeah, uh, every <laughs> every you time know. you get a uh, a promotion, maybe maybe you get uh -huh. a diploma, yep. or maybe okay. it's kind of like CIA agents are kind of like dentists, where you want to <laughs> make sure that they are qualified, and they yeah. they hang up all of their dental diplomas on the. Is that a normal thing? That's the only for dentists. Yeah, that's what my dentist Yeah, had. I I think so. I think a lot of, like, doctors will have this stuff on their wall. Is that a law? Do they have to do that? Or is it just something they choose to do? Well, is it like, I always assumed it was like they were proud of it. Like, I thought that was something you just did in your office. I was going to hang mine up when I had an office. Right, you're, you're just your degree from Emerson? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I saved it. 
I hung that up in my bedroom when I got it. Yeah. And then not too long later, I was my mom was like, why do you have that hung up? I was like, because I, I went to college and I worked hard. And it, this is proof of that. And she's like, yeah, yeah. it's kind of weird that you have it hung up. I don't I think like, that's weird. I don't think it's weird either, but I took it down. So I don't know where it is. <laughs> I hung up, um, this was while I was in college, so I did it in my childhood bedroom that I didn't spend a lot of time in, but one summer I hung up my high school diploma and then my high school graduation cap, and then like later when I was back there after college, I hung up my college diploma and my college graduation cap, and it was nice. Yeah, Um, that's what I had, I had, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't there long enough to appreciate it, but I thought it was a pretty good idea, and I support you in what you chose to do. Just a couple of pathetic losers who... (laughs) Just we're cling proud to of these, ourselves damn it our, our little achievements yeah we got bachelor's degrees how many people do you know that have bachelor's degrees yeah in fact we got you, you gotta say the truth chris we got bfas that's even better that's even more worth something <laughs> <laughs> we have to take comfort where we can ellie shows justin the classifieds ad code and justin says that as soon as they find out where steven is they can start protecting him Ellie is still concerned about Casey as a threat, so Justin gives her what looks like an old-fashioned, like, iHome kind of thing, but it's actually, like, is is EMP, I was going to Google this, but that's electromagnetic pulse, is that, like, kind of, it's, like, some type of thing that's going to cut off all of Casey's communications. This doesn't really come up again, so, like, she has the speaker, but we don't really get a scene of, like, Casey, like, reacting to, like, why isn't my phone working? Yeah, Uh, there's... uh, the it's supposed to be some kind of scrambler of some yes, kind, yeah. but the only time that it comes back, it turns out there's it's just basically like a little safe that has a handgun in it. <laughs> yes, yeah. So it's so it's, it's a uh, multi versatile <laughs> machine that looks yeah. like an iHome that just has a gun inside of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've never checked my iHome. It might have a gun. It would certainly be big enough. Yeah. Meanwhile, Those things are clunky. They're big. Meanwhile, in Castle, Sarah confronts Chuck about all the lies he's been telling recently, like the one to his dad, the one to her about Shaw. He's almost caught up in another lie he told her about the doctor saying he was completely healthy. Casey comes in and says he'll help them check up on Shaw, but won't tell Beckman anything until they're sure. Which is, again, like, I kind of get not wanting to tell your boss there's an issue until you're sure, but, like, I understand why Chuck, who's not, like, really trained in spycraft, would maybe want to keep things secret, but I feel like Casey and Sarah would be like, yes, we have to alert Beckman. Like, they would know better, but I don't know. They don't. Casey says he hasn't gotten any hits on any of Shaw's fake IDs, but maybe Sarah going through everything she ever did with Shaw will cause Chuck to flash on something. Chuck and Sarah both feel weird about this, and Chuck starts getting weird and jealous when Sarah talks about dinner dates, couples massages, all of that stuff. She talks about Shaw taking her to Tiffany's and Casey points out that Sarah is wearing a pair of new earrings. And I feel like I I don't care about like keeping a gift that your ex gave you. But like, it's kind of weird that like Sarah is like, oh, like she covers up her earrings like he tried to kill her. I feel like she wouldn't like, I don't know. I'm kind of like, like good on her for like wanting to like move past it and like display these beautiful earrings. But like, that's it's a little weird. Yeah, that's pretty weird. Yeah. Finally, after what seems like a long time, Chuck gets a flash on Shaw's apartment, which, why didn't they start there? Like, did that not even come up that they would, like, maybe, like, talk about the time Sarah went there or just, like, go there? Also, like, Shaw had an apartment this whole time? Like, we were, like, he was living in Castle, and then he was uh, living in that hotel. When did he get an apartment? I don't, I don't know, know, but it's a, it's a, not just a regular apartment. This yeah, is, like, a, a penthouse. massive penthouse yeah, on huge. the top floor. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Chuck flashes on that and realizes that Shaw ordered the construction of a safe in that apartment. The team decides to go there. Uh, Before they get there, we cut to a scene of Jeffster performing on the curb outside the Bymore, which I guess is something they're doing now. Uh, A woman tries to pay them to stop playing, which I don't know, Chris, are are you that woman? Would you be that woman if you saw them in person? Uh, unless they were going acoustic, in which case I'd be like, all right, I'm on board for this. You'd like take out your uh, lighter and start waving it around. Any of their electric stuff is just too heavy for me. I can't I, do it. I understand. Uh, Big Mike comes out and offers to be their manager since they're too good to be playing outside an electronics store. Jeff is into this idea, but Lester says commercialism is bad and just like ups, up and quits the band. He tells Jeff he's taking something precious with him. The stir. I thought that was kind of funny. Back at the apartment complex, Ellie sees her dad in Chuck's apartment and rushes over. She seems like she feels weird about him being there instead of just telling her his address, but he says that's safer. I think the other issue that Ellie is worried about is that, like, 
he is more she feels like he's more in danger because Casey is in this apartment complex, but she doesn't really say that. Was he just was Steven in Chuck's apartment making French toast? He was in toast? Chuck's apartment. I I thought he was making grilled cheese, but it could have been French toast. Um yeah. But then I was just, wondering, I'm like, does Steven know that Ellie doesn't live in that apartment anymore? Did he just uh, go to that apartment instinctively thinking it was Ellie's? I would assume that like there is a conversation that happened off screen where Chuck was like, Yes, so I live in that apartment now. Here is my key. Morgan also lives there. You can hang out. You can use my uh, bread to make French toast, blah, blah, blah. So I guess the question is, uh, you know, like, obviously we have this episode in front of us, but did the real episode all take place off screen? It seems like there's a, a good amount of inference happening. That Well, you know what they say, like, shows should be like an iceberg, like only like we only see like the top 10 percent. But there's so much going on under the surface that it's just like bursting, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's bursting. All right. <laughs> Meanwhile, Chuck and Casey are entering the courtyard, and Chuck asks Casey to keep an eye on Ellie. Casey agrees. Chuck goes into his apartment, and Stephen asks his children, who he hasn't seen in, like, a year? I don't I don't know exactly the timeline, but he hasn't seen them in a long time. And he asks them uh, what they want to do now that he's there visiting. And Chuck says he has date night with Sarah, who, who he lives with. Like, I know it's actually a mission, but it seems like Stephen would feel this was really harsh, because he's like, I'm back, kids. And Chuck's like, yeah, I'm going to go see my girlfriend who I live with. Like, I see her all the time. She'll be here later. But uh, yeah, I'm just going out with her. Stephen says he'll just hang out with Ellie, but Ellie gets a call from Justin. She runs out into the courtyard to take it and tells Justin that her dad is there. He tells her to meet him alone and they'll figure out what to do. Casey watches from his window and makes to follow her. So here's one thing, and we can we can talk about it now or we can talk about it at the end, but I wanted to talk about how do you think this back half of the season would have worked better or do you think it would have worked worse if, like, there wasn't any Justin character and it was just Shaw the whole time? I was kind of thinking it would be interesting if, like, because Ellie obviously never met Shaw. I don't think. I don't think there was ever a scene. So, like, things would have to be a little bit different, but I kind of thought that would be really interesting. Like, we know it's the ring already. I guess we don't know for sure that Shaw is alive at this point, but, like, we're we're pretty sure based on, like, Chuck's dreams and the intersects and stuff. I don't really have a lot of doubt of that. So mm -hmm. I thought it would be kind of interesting if it was just, like, Shaw was manipulating Ellie and Shaw was the one, like, I don't know. Can you picture that? Yeah, I can see that. I... It would be interesting because, I, like you said, I don't, Ellie probably wouldn't have met Shaw. Yeah. And so I think it, in one way it would kind of create this sense of drama and suspense to have Shaw so clearly influencing Ellie mm -hmm. and kind of uh, infiltrating Chuck's inner circle in mm -hmm. a different way than he had before. And I feel like that could be really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, would that it would kind of take away some of the punch of thinking that Shaw is still dead at this point. Well, we like, known. do you, do you think, like, I would say I thought Shaw was dead in the, in the episode, like, when they were on the train. Like, I feel like that, like, that episode, they don't really bring it up. But as soon as Chuck starts having the dreams about Shaw and has, mm -hmm. like, that, like, cliffhanger where he has the dream and he's like, you're alive. Like, I feel like, I don't know if the episode kind of wants us to think, like, maybe Chuck is crazy, but I don't feel like I had that those doubts at all. I was like, of course, he's going to be alive if Chuck is flashing on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I do like the the idea of the character of Justin, because I feel yeah. like he uh, obviously is a minor character, but I think that he it's kind of an interesting device to have this guy who is, like you said, very charming mm -hmm. and seems to be presenting a pretty solid case for why Ellie should be helping him. Mm -hmm. And all the while he is uh, misguiding her and yeah. trying to take advantage of her. So and he ends up being in cahoots with Shaw, so... Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting idea. I hadn't really it thought of that before. probably would have cost more money to have Brandon Routh in more episodes, so maybe that's why they didn't do it. Maybe Justin was a little cheaper, but... Uh, True. Would have been Brandon, cool. Brandon Routh is not actually in this episode, even though Shaw is. Yeah, yes. Uh, and we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Yeah. So, alone in Chuck's apartment after Ellie storms out, Stephen tells Chuck that he suspects that Chuck is still working for the CIA and finds a surveillance wire behind Chuck's TV, and he notices that Chuck's laptop is still logged into the CIA mainframe. Chuck admits that he's been doing some analyst work for the CIA, nothing dangerous, and then his nose grows because he just lied to his father, just <gasps> like another, another hero named Pinocchio, <laughs> who also lied to his father and then got eaten by a whale, and then turned into a donkey on this Ooh. island of donkey boys. Pleasure, pleasure Island, baby. That, 
stuff that shit screwed me up man <laughs> it's, I, hate, I hate pinocchio it's traumatizing it. it was Although, very traumatizing i do uh i do have a little uh doll of figaro the cat that's fine it's a cute cute cat and they I'll got the fish it. jiminy cricket so that, that's pinocchio right yep I don't know if I've ever seen Pinocchio in full. There's like a lot of classic Disney movies that like I feel like I know by reputation. Mm -hmm. I did watch The Fox and the Hound a lot as a baby. That was like my favorite film when I was like a toddler. This is a fun conversation. Also, also scarring. Yeah, it is. It really is. (laughs) So, yes, Chuck says that he's not doing anything dangerous. And then cut to Chuck and Sarah scaling the side of Shaw's building. Elsewhere, Ellie sits outside on a bench waiting for Justin to show up. Casey has followed Ellie and taps into her phone and hears her leaving a message for Justin, which uh, sounds if you don't have the information of like knowing what Ellie is actually doing and you're like Casey and are just kind of trying to piece it together now. It sounds like uh, Ellie is having an affair or okay, trying like, to meet with a lover. It it does sound like I see how you could make that interpretation, but I also feel like they're not giving her enough benefit of the doubt because like if she had some if she had said something like, I can't wait to come over and have sex with you, like that would be one thing. But she's just like, I need to see you. I'm lying to my husband and I want to stop or like whatever. Like you don't have to assume she's like cheating on him, but they do. Yeah. But have you met Devin? He's kind of a loser. That's true. Yeah, no one would be surprised if uh, someone was unsatisfied with him as a lover. (laughs) Uh, Chuck and Sarah break into Shaw's penthouse, which is very nice, as you might suspect. Chuck browses through the books on Shaw's bookcase and finds a copy (laughs) of the Kama Sutra, which makes him uncomfortable. (laughs) That's weird. That's cool. Like, good for Shaw. I don't know. Shaw is just a uh, very skilled lover, I guess. Yeah, he's a sex king. Sarah, meanwhile, uses thermal imaging goggles to find Shaw's secret safe hidden behind a photograph of the Eiffel Tower. And Chuck's all like, I love the Eiffel Tower. Can I keep this picture? I want (laughs) to hang this up in my apartment. Uh, Sarah hits a secret button on the photograph and it slides over, revealing the safe. Sarah and Chuck realize that the safe is password protected. But before they can attempt to crack into it, they hear Shaw opening the front door. (gasps) Uh Uh-oh. Chuck and Sarah run into a walk-in closet adjacent to the wall because I guess that's just... This is really the season of hiding in walk-in closets because <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just yeah. did that in versus the role models. Uh, so they're they're technically behind the safe. So they stand silently wearing their thermal imaging goggles and watching Shaw walk up to the secret safe, uh, open it, and then remove a suitcase that's inside of it. Shaw seems to be headed out unperturbed when Chuck's foot slides and his converse make a squeaking noise. Damn Shaw, converse. Shaw is alarmed by this, but then doesn't seem bothered by it. But then ultimately shoots the wall of the safe, nearly shooting Chuck and Sarah in the face. After firing several bullets into the wall, Shaw grabs the suitcase and runs out. Chuck and Sarah follow. They chase him up the stairs to the roof of the building. And between you and me, I'm starting to question whether or not this is even Shaw. Upon arriving on the roof, Shaw, I just did air quotes, listener, shoots at Chuck and Sarah again, but misses. And they chase him until he decides to jump off the roof onto the next building. Uh, We see that he's carrying a golden suitcase, which he proceeds to drop as he attempts to jump to the next building. It's kind of a a far leap, I suppose. Sarah tries to shoot him, but Chuck says that they need Shaw alive. So Chuck tells Sarah to go retrieve the suitcase from the street while he makes the long distance jump and chases Shaw. Chuck flashes and barely makes the jump. Like Shaw, he hangs onto the ledge of the building. We hear footsteps approaching Chuck and Chuck says Shaw, but it's not Shaw. It's Justin. Justin. Justin says... Justin says Shaw's dead. Care to join him? And tries to knock Chuck off the ledge. When Sarah starts to shoot at him from the street, Justin retreats and Chuck starts to slip, pleading for Sarah to help him. When we hear footsteps running towards Chuck, Chuck thinks Justin's coming back at him, but it's Steven. Steven strains to pull Chuck up to safety and says, just an analyst, huh? I think this is kind of interesting because it's the first time, I mean, that I know of, that I can think of off the top of my head that we've seen like, even though Chuck flashed and used the intersect, like, he still failed. Like, he was still going to fall off that building. He didn't really make the jump. So I mm-hmm. think that's interesting, because there's, like, some limitations on what the intersect can feasibly do. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I I don't, like, think that there are any larger implications, unless you want to read that as, like, that's part of the intersect, like, kind of degrading Chuck's mind. Like, maybe that was why it didn't work. Um, but they don't really touch on that. I just thought it was, like, interesting. Later that night, Chuck shows Steven around Castle. Steven wants to know why Chuck lied to him about being an analyst, and Chuck continues to lie and says that he <laughs> is an analyst, but he occasionally goes out for field missions. If there are children out there, don't lie to your parents, especially oh. to your fathers. 
and uh, unless if the, they're uh, uh, supernatural beings. And to all of the fathers that are listening, which I guess is more of our target demographic than actual children, uh, I don't take any bullshit from those kids. Oh, I have I have a message for all the fathers out there. Yeah. Um, fathers, be good to your daughters. Daughters will love. I don't remember the rest of the song. Daughters will love like you do. Girls become lovers who turn into mothers. So fathers, be good to your daughters, too. Wow, Aaron, that was really profound. That was Thank beautiful. you. Yeah, I wrote that myself. That's amazing. You should Thank try you. to do something with that. Yeah, I might. I might like add. I was kind of thinking like a synth would sound good in that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Kind of I'm... like uh, what, what uh, Jeff is going to do in one of the following scenes. That's true. Let me uh, wipe the tears from my eyes so I can <laughs> read my notes better. Doing nothing to downplay the importance of these field missions in front of his father, Chuck then leaves Stephen in a computer room to ask Casey and Sarah what they were able to find out about Justin. Just very loudly talks about <laughs> this mission that he clearly just went yeah. on. Casey says that they couldn't get a good look at the mystery man, but they were able to open the golden suitcase. Turns out it contains one of those futuristic frisbee looking lock boxes from earlier this season. Sarah and Casey explain that spies have these lock boxes for spy next of kin purposes. The spies are supposed to keep track of their own like will and testament and all of that stuff on their own. Uh, and all of their intel, I guess, in case they get killed and need to pass their intel along. Uh -huh. All of Shaw's lockbox information in this case would be about the ring. So it's natural that the ring would want to be adamant about retrieving it. Casey speculates that the guy from the roof was just a low level thug that the ring paid to retrieve the lockbox. Chuck takes all of this to mean that Shaw is actually dead and that this is confirmed when Sarah starts to read a letter that Shaw left in the lockbox, which states, my name is Daniel Shaw. I graduated from one of Canada's top business schools with really good grades. No, the, the letter is actually that, says... Is that from something? Yeah, it was Nathan for you. Oh, okay, okay. My name is Daniel Shaw. If you're reading this, I'm already dead. A letter which was typed on a computer, but has the most unnatural, like, indents. In okay, page. I got that too! <laughs> the it's, text starts at, like, the top of the yeah, page. Yeah, there's no it, margins. There's no margins anywhere. <laughs> It's very uh, weird. <laughs> it was like, what? Uh, anyhow, Stephen overhears all of this and asks what's going on. He says that he recognizes the name Daniel Shaw and knows that he was the CIA's top ring expert. Chuck tells him that the mission is over, but Stephen tells him that the missions are never over and there will always be one more mission. Stephen explains that spies need lockboxes because any mission could be their last and the CIA doesn't care about the lives of individuals. He tells Chuck that he doesn't want his family to have any part in this kind of messed up business. Good thing Steven has at least one child who isn't wrapped up in all this spy stuff. Just kidding. Cut to Ellie in Justin's <sighs> office. She sees the cut on his face, which he apparently got from the night before. She asks how it happened, but he brushes it off and says that all that matters is her father's safety. Ellie asks what she's supposed to do since Casey is watching her like a hawk. And Justin says that they've developed a new plan, but it is going to require some spy work on her part. And now we have a declassified scene. Oh, exciting. Back in Castle, Casey is escorting Steven out of the building, and Chuck makes to follow them when Sarah pulls Chuck aside. Sarah says that she understands why Steven wants to protect Chuck because being a spy is so dangerous, and she says that she wouldn't know what she would do if, and then she she trails off. She can't get herself to say it, uh, you know, saying that if, like, Chuck died. Yeah, yeah. Chuck says that he's going to be fine, and Sarah reminds him that the actor Christopher Lloyd told them that if his <laughs> dreams are accurate, that means Chuck's okay, but if the dreams are wrong and it's not accurate to what's in the intersect, then Chuck could be in danger. Chuck counters by saying that the actor Christopher Lloyd told him that not all of his dreams need to be accurate to prove that the intersect is working properly. Chuck asks Sarah to trust him and ensures her that he's never felt better. They embrace, and Chuck stares down at the floor. That's That's sad. And I have some more sad news for you, Aaron. What, what is it? That was the final declassified scene of season three. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah. So like everything one. else, everything else that we see is just 100 percent on the page. That's right. The... Everything else is is you see what you get. Yeah. They didn't cut anything else out because all of it was so good. It's it just 100 percent, 100 percent gold. Yeah. So like that suitcase. Back at the Buy More, the solo version of Jeffster, appropriately entitled Jeff, question mark, <laughs> performs inside the store under the watchful guidance of Big Mike. Jeff plays the keyboard by himself and sings with auto-tune and is really, really bad at it. Big Mike encourages him to switch up the lyrics, and Jeff ends up just accosting a woman who's trying to shop. 
Lester watches on in disapproval when Casey approaches him and asks if he's seen Morgan. He can't seem to find him anywhere. Lester gives Casey a lovelorn monologue about what it's like to part ways with a good friend. But Casey doesn't have time for that kind of bullshit, so he storms <laughs> off. Casey busts in into uh, Morgan's office slash custodial closet to find that Morgan has barricaded the office so Shaw can't get to him. Casey informs Morgan that Chuck was wrong and that Shaw is definitely dead. Casey then proceeds to ask Morgan if he thinks Ellie, uh, Ellie would ever cheat on Devin. Morgan is offended and says that Ellie would never do that unless it was potentially with him. But then Casey plays the recording of Ellie's voicemail to Justin from the other night. It does seem pretty damning in the context of adultery. Morgan realizes that he needs to intervene and tells Casey that he will take it from there, even though he's not looking forward to it. Cut to inside of Devin and Ellie's apartment. Morgan interviews Devin and asks if he and Ellie are having any problems. Morgan insists that if they are having any marital discord, it's Devin's fault. Morgan asks Devin to walk him through a normal day in the life of their marriage, and Devin obliges and begins to explain that he always wakes up early to put a towel in the dryer so it's warm for when Ellie is ready to take a shower. That's really nice. I would love that. And then he'll make her something easy for breakfast, like a Belgian waffle or a goat cheese omelet. That's not, I mean, those are, it's played like those are really hard, but those, like, they're not really that hard to make. Yeah, maybe you should keep that in mind when Seth is eating a bowl of cereal for breakfast and he's like, wow, I really wish I had I just feel a like Belgian if we waffle. said like a frittata or something, like if you have a if you have a waffle maker, like we could do that in college. Like it's not like rocket science. Anyhow, several beers later, Devin continues saying that he'll give Ellie a foot massage like in the middle of the day and then he'll go to the farmer's market to buy fresh fruit to make her a midday smoothie. Several beers after that, he concludes by saying that each night he draws her a lavender bath and then stays up to watch her sleep for 20 minutes because he loves her so much. Morgan is enchanted by all of this. And also, Devin, is Devin just like a stay-at-home husband at this point? Because he hasn't been in the hospital for a while, and he obviously has a lot of free time. Is he uh, Is he still recovering from his bout with poisoning? Yeah, maybe. But this is America. We don't care how sick you are. You need to be working at That's all true. times. That's true, yeah. Back in Chuck's apartment, Stephen is sitting alone having a personal crisis. Chuck walks in and asks if something's the matter. Stephen says that he doesn't understand why the CIA would let Chuck go on field missions if he doesn't have the intersect in his head. And at this moment, I just noticed that Chuck and Morgan have a tobacco store statue of a Native yeah, American yeah, in their I, apartment. Yeah, I noticed that too. Was, has that not always been there or is that um, new? I have never seen it before. That doesn't mean it hasn't always been there. It could have just been certain camera angles that we've yeah. missed it. But yeah, I don't know what that is. Like most of the things in their apartment seem to be like nerdy references or just like normal furniture. And then like that's there. So I want to know the story. Maybe maybe it's Sarah's. Maybe she brought it when she moved in. I don't have any belongings except for this massive wooden statue. This yeah. really outdated yeah. <laughs> statue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, they have a foosball table. Oh, that's, that's nice. Yeah, I didn't notice that, but that is nice. Chuck says that the CIA believes in him and thinks that he's special. Steven says that Chuck is special and proceeds to throw an old time uh, an old timey letter opener at Chuck's face. Chuck flashes and catches the letter opener no problem. Steven is pissed because this means that Chuck download, downloaded the Intersect 2.0. And Chuck is pissed because his dad threw what is basically a small knife at his face. Steven asks why Chuck would do that when they worked so hard to remove the Intersect in the first place. And Chuck asks what would have happened if Steven was wrong and Chuck didn't have the Intersect 2.0, to which Steven says that he's never wrong. Steven begins to storm out when he reveals that he didn't want to alarm Chuck before, but the Intersect can have a ne negative effect on the brain. Chuck is upset that Steven didn't tell him this before, and Steven said that he didn't think he needed to uh, because he thought they were done, which is a valid point. He, why would he think that? He'd be like, hey, remember that thing that was in your head? That was bad, but it's not in your head anymore, so who cares? Uh, Chuck says that he didn't tell Steven about the intersect because he knew he would disapprove and that he just is trying to live his life because Steven left him again. Chuck says that Steven taught Ellie and him how to live life without him, and that's what they are doing. Steven is hurt by this and gathers his things. Chuck asks where he's going, and Steven apologizes and says that he can't sit there and watch his son die. I mean, valid, I guess. As Steven storms out of Chuck's apartment, he bumps into Ellie. Ellie asks where he's going, and Steven says that he has to leave and that he doesn't understand why Ellie asked him to show up in the first place, which is a, a good question. Ellie says that nothing is wrong and that she just missed him and wanted to say, make sure that he was okay. Steven says that she doesn't have to worry about him and he won't be gone for too long. Ellie and Steven, Ellie and Steven hug, and Ellie plants a tracker onto Steven's back. Ellie, what are <gasps> you doing? Ellie! They say goodbye, and Steven hurries away. Ellie immediately takes out her phone and calls Justin to tell him that she placed the tracer on Steven. Justin congratulates her and says that she is guaranteed her father's protection as he watches Steven's movements on a GPS screen. 
Steven arrives back at his cabin, presumably stepping over the dead guy from Chuck versus the Tic Tac, <laughs> and immediately opens a secret, a secret computer wall. This is intercut with Chuck talking to Sarah at their apartment. Chuck says that his dad left again, and Sarah insists that it must have been for a good reason. Chuck says that he knows that his dad loves him, but his dad doesn't know anything about him, including why he wanted to keep the intersect. As he says this, we see Steven removing something from his wristwatch and inserting it into the supercomputer. Steven says that uh, to himself, this better work, as Sarah tells Chuck that she managed to steal Steven's driver's license. So Steven was driving without a driver's license. Oh, that's this whole time. dangerous. That's, he drove back that's to illegal. His cabin. Yeah. You should always, you know, when, if you're driving, you should always check to make sure you have your driver's license yeah, before you, you get in the car. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And make sure it's not expired, too, because like sometimes that sneaks up on you. Yeah. And it can take sure. a long time to get an appointment. Like you don't want to wait in those long lines. So you should ideally you should make an appointment to go to the DMV uh, at least three months in advance of your license expiring. The more you know, uh, Chuck is thinking along the lines of what I was thinking, where I was like, that can't, license can't be real. Why would Steven, who's so paranoid about being followed in the government, have a driver's license on him with an address? But Sarah runs it through the CIA system and has pretty concrete evidence that this is his real address because there's no... I don't think that's what happened. I think what happened is that she ran the license through the database and saw where the license was issued from. And then she traced like that county. That's what that's what she said. She found out that it was it came from like whatever county. And then she looked at electrical records for that county and saw which house was using the most electricity but didn't have gas. Like, I don't think his real uh, address was listed. I just think she used it to figure out like the general area that he lived in. OK, Chris. That's a valid point, listener. I'm just too dumb to understand what Sarah did. Sarah's she doing. She said it. I know, but I was like, you did what? <laughs> uh, so, all right, whatever. So Steven is working diligently on the computer chip from his watch and swaps it out with another computer chip uh, when he gets a notification that there was a perimeter breach and that there are people surrounding his cabin. The leader of these insurgents calls Justin to tell him that they found Steven and Justin tells them not to call him again until they have it, whatever it is. Steven finishes his work hides the supercomputer and takes out a taser. He ducks behind his kitchen table as the insurgents knock down his door and roll a flash grenade into the room. So meanwhile, Chuck and Sarah pull up outside the cabin and Chuck tells Sarah to come in if he's not out in 20 minutes. Meanwhile, the soldier guys have beaten Steven up and are demanding that he tell them where the governor is. So I guess that's what it is, but we still don't know exactly what the governor is. When Chuck knocks on the door, they drag him in too and tie him and Steven up. As one of the guys goes to hit Steven again, he sees Steven's watch and realizes that, that must be where he's keeping the governor. So he takes it and then tells his men to cut the gas line so they can blow up the cabin and make it look like an accident. Chuck tells his dad that he came to explain why he downloaded the Intersect 2.0, but it's easier if he just shows his dad. He flashes, breaks loose from his bonds, and a fight sequence begins. The bad guys can't use their guns because of the gas leak, so that makes things a little uh, easier and a little uh, closer closer quarters. Uh, Chuck takes out a bunch of guys. Sarah hears the commotion and comes in, and even Steven helps. Steven asks if Sarah has the intersect too because she's so good at fighting, but Chuck says no, that's all her. Steven heads back to LA with Chuck and eventually explains that the governor is a, sort of like a pacemaker for the intersect, which stops it from overheating and potentially causing brain issues there's kind of a sweet moment as he says he's going to make one for chuck so chuck can be the man he wants to be so steven's okay with chuck being a spy yay meanwhile big mike is making a manager speech to lester saying he wants to help lester be the man he wants to be lester is reluctant even when big mike points out that jeff called his solo act jeff with a question mark but big mike goes on to say that he used to be part of a band called Earth, Wind, Fire, and Rain. And he was the rain. That's unclear. He gives Lester his old gold jumpsuit, and Lester says, where do I sign? Outside Big Mike's office, Morgan asks to speak to Casey. He confirms there's no problems in Ellie's relationship on Devin's end, and that both Ellie and Devin are out. So Casey is free to sneak into their apartment and try to figure out what's going on. Morgan asks the big money question, why does Casey care if Ellie's having an affair? Casey says he promised Chuck he'd protect Ellie. So I guess, like, I mean, having an affair, like, I'm sure causes, like, emotional turmoil and all those kinds of things. But I don't know why it's, like, protecting Ellie. Like, she's not, like, in danger if she's having an affair, you know? True. 
Yeah, I mean, if she's having an affair, maybe she feels like she's not safe in her own marriage. Yeah, exactly. But I don't know. Casey's Casey promised he'd protect her, so he's going to do it. He's a pretty conservative guy. He really uh, believes in the sanctity of marriage, I think. <laughs> yeah, I guess probably uh, that seems in character for him. So he sneaks into Ellie and Devin's and is looking around, planting bugs, when Ellie comes in, already on the phone with Justin. He says he's coming over, but Ellie hears a floorboard creak upstairs and realizes that someone else is in the house. And she assumes it's Casey. Justin tells her to open the speaker, and at that point we find out that it has the handgun inside of it. She takes it out, but she says that she definitely can't use it. Justin says she may have to. As Casey comes down the stairs, Ellie hides, but when he gets close enough, she jumps out and whacks him with a frying pan. So she doesn't shoot him, but she does, like, hit him pretty brutally and knock him out. Once he's passed out, she runs outside and right into Justin, who tells her to come with him. They run. It's a classic example of Chekhov's iHome speaker, where yeah. if you introduce a iHome speaker in the beginning, the yeah, first yeah. act, then the, the iHome speaker will have to return in the third yeah. act. Classic one example. Of, one of my favorite tropes. Absolutely. So in their own apartment, apparently Sarah and Chuck haven't uh, heard any of this going on. Um, Sarah is looking at one of those spy will things. I thought it was going to be Shaw's, but actually it's hers. She tells, I wrote she tells Sarah, she tells herself, but no, she tells Chuck that if anything happens to her, she wants him to have it. And they have a, a little sweet moment. And then a song by The Bravery plays, and that was pretty fun. Uh, Justin brings Ellie back into his office and tells her she'll be safe there. But when he leaves, we see him lock her in. Ah, as Chuck sits down to write his own spy will, we get a montage of all of his loved ones ending with, so this last scene kind of confuses me and I don't know if it confused you at all, but I thought that I saw Justin in this like white ring base room that looks kind of like an intersect room. And I thought I saw him put his hand on some kind of scanner. And then it says, ID confirmed Daniel Shaw. But is that, was it just, like, shot from behind? Like, I watched it twice, but I was still kind of unclear. Like, I I was pretty sure that was Justin, but then it was actually Shaw. Well, I think the, it's, so it's not actually Brandon Routh, but it's a body double of Shaw. Okay. Because it's, you never see Shaw's face in real yeah. time in this thing. Mm -hmm. So, I, it, I don't think it was Justin. However, okay. I see your confusion because also Justin was being used as the, like, the imposter Shaw before. Uh-huh. Right? Like, in the penthouse and everything? Yeah, it seems like there's a little bit of confusion. Yeah, there's... I could I could see being confused by all of the Shaw impersonators <laughs> in this particular episode. Yeah. I, I personally was confused at this moment because I was like, wait a second. I sat down, I thought I was watching Chuck, but now the ending of this episode... Am I watching Scrubs? Has this been an episode <laughs> of Scrubs this whole time with this reflective monologue that the main character is... is journaling and then we get to see how it pertains to all of the other characters and friends in his life maybe it's the thing i never saw coming right turk <laughs> <laughs> ah i see you're fluent in scrubs ah yes i i know exactly two characters names <laughs> and then the janitor guy i don't know his name but he's in uh he's in another show he's in a, a popular abc show uh, the middle right yes yeah okay I wanted to call it Malcolm in the middle, but I was like, I know that's not right, because that has someone very special in it, and it's not that guy. Freaky Muniz! Perfect, thank you. So, uh, yeah, Shaw scans his hand, and uh, it starts downloading the intersect. There's all the images on the screen. We see his body kind of twitching, and he's uh, watching it all happen. And that's the end. Pretty, pretty scary stuff. Also, I would like to point out that when Chuck is writing his own spy will, he also has insane... Like, there's no margins. Maybe, uh, there, okay, maybe there's a template on Word, and it's like, seems like you're writing your spy will. And then they just <laughs> remove all the margins. Yeah, what, what is it? Clippy comes out? Yeah, yeah. It says, hey, Clippy here. Are you a spy that might die in, in the field? <laughs> if so, right, use uh, the no margin or indent option It's kind of like Word. when uh, we were in college or high school, and they let us do, like, cheeky cheat sheets for like taking a test and you wanted to write like as small as possible and as close to the margins as possible <laughs> that's what spy wills. i mean like if they're if they have as much like uh what's what's the word like this like kind of introduction like where like chuck is just like maybe i die from this maybe i die from this like if they spend that much time doing that kind of thing like yeah they gotta use their space where they can it's true i guess they do want to maximize and be efficient with their space yep so Shaw's back. He was dead, but he's alive. And that, he's alive. for that reason, he is the living dead. 
yeah, that's I I couldn't remember the title to this episode when I was looking it up to do a little bit of research on it. And then when I found out that was the title, I was like, what? But I do. I guess I understand it now. I think it's a cool episode title, and I'm glad that they did not do any more like heavy handed zombie references yeah, yeah. or anything throughout the episode, because I was like braced, bracing myself for that yeah. to be like. Um, but maybe that's just because I've also been rewatching Community and there's the whole zombie episode with that. Well, uh, you're forgetting that they have the uh, the greatest zombie of them all in the episode. They didn't need to do any more. Well, I wasn't forgetting, but the last time I saw the actor, Christopher Lloyd, he told me that I should try to mentally block that out and try to try to forget that he's there. Thank you, actor Christopher Lloyd. Uh, so now that we have discussed Chuck versus the living dead or the living dad, we're going to talk about Chuck, Mary kill, where we take one part of this episode that we'd like to marry and one part of this episode that we'd like to kill and then uh, probably have come back in a few episodes later. <laughs> For my Mary, um, I really liked Earth, Wind, Fire and Rain. That's like oh, yeah? a, that's a kind of joke that I feel like Chuck doesn't really do, like this kind of like rewriting of like, a, like that's not really the vibe sense of humor of Chuck. We don't have a lot of things where it's like one of these characters actually was a part of this like famous band. And I just thought it was really funny. Um, I remember liking it the first time I saw it, and I liked it now. I think the the plot line with Jester was, like, a little weak, but I did really like that moment, and I did really like the, like, photoshopped picture of Big Mike. Nice. Yeah. What about you? Uh, I would like to marry the scene between Devin and Morgan when Devin talks about his day-to-day -day life with and all the oh, stuff yeah, that he does for scene. Ellie. Uh, I feel like we haven't had this kind of, like, over-the-top captain awesome humor yeah. in a while mm -hmm. and it was just a delightful little exchange yeah uh because i was concerned at first that devin wasn't going to be in the episode at all because it seemed like there was a lot of that they were doing the things that they would do if devin was not going to appear in the episode but then mm -hmm. uh and i guess this is this is one of the only times that he appears in the episode uh so i was surprised to see him and it was a highlight for me because i was i was laughing out loud yeah it was it was very i remembered that being a funny scene and it lived up to my memory um, for my kill, just based on the fact that I was so confused by it, I'm going to say the ending. I mean, I like the implications of Shaw getting an intersect, but just like the confusion of what's going on, who that was. Like, I understand having to use a body double. I, I don't want to ask Chuck to spend more money than it has to, but I was very confused. I thought this was just in like, even just the way they shot it, the way they framed it. Um, I think that it could have been done a little bit better. It could have been a little bit clearer. They could have just like shown someone putting their hand. They don't have to show somebody's body, but I was just really confused. And since that's such like a big reveal, I wanted it to be a little bit clearer. Mm -hmm. And you? I will be, uh, I would like to kill the, uh, the Jeffster, the plot line. Oh, okay. Because it wasn't even, it wasn't a B plot, it was like a C plot. No, yeah. And it just kind of felt unnecessary. And just More like an F plot. In there. Ooh. Oh, that's, I wouldn't give it an F necessarily, <laughs> okay. but maybe a maybe a C or a, yeah. a D. Yeah. I would have just, it felt, obviously there's the overlap of Casey coming in and being like, where's Morgan? So they do tie in, but it almost felt like all of that stuff was shot just for a random episode. And they yeah. just were like, yeah, we could drop it in here. Yeah. Um, I would have liked it more if they didn't resolve the conflict. The uh -huh. internal struggle between Jeff and Lester right away, and we got uh -huh. a couple of episodes exploring the rift between them. Yeah, that would uh, be interesting. Because it just kind of felt like it was setting up this big... And we, like, as viewers of the show, we know how big of a deal Jester is to them and their relationship, so mm -hmm. if they're going to have this falling out, it could be interesting to explore that and take yeah. its time, and um, it just kind of felt like it, they happened at the beginning, it got resolved at the end, it just kind of felt like a useless little aside. Yeah. Um, and then I was confused because... I thought we would see like a shot of Lester performing wearing the gold jumpsuit, but he doesn't. But does that come back later? Maybe it'll come back in like the, the finale finale. Yeah. Or maybe that's what not. I was thinking. Who knows? I, yeah, I have no idea. I feel yeah. like he could, but I have no idea. So yeah. I was He'd just look like, good in it. Yeah. Because what does Big Mike say? He has the, the Lester the, has the, 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 hips the hips of a six year old girl. Accurate. What is also accurate is the scooter scale where we rate this episode using a sliding scale of corn dogs. Sometimes we have zero corn dogs. We've never actually had zero corn dogs, but not yet. Uh, we have five corn dogs and and anywhere in between. We don't stick to whole numbers. Sometimes we give half corn dogs. That happens. It's fine. Don't worry about it. We're very accurate. It's actually yeah. It's gonna happen today because I'm giving this episode two point five corn dogs. Two point five. I um I watched this episode as I told Chris. I watched this episode this morning, like shortly before recording, and. 
without my notes, I probably wouldn't have remembered a lot that happened. I think that um, it's it's a fine like it's it's well written, it's well paced. I like that. I like the implications. I like that Steven's back. I think a lot of the struggles feel realistic, but I just felt like in practice the episode was a little bit forgettable for me. Mm-hmm. It wasn't uh, wasn't really one of my favorites, but uh, the, well, which. It is unfortunate because, as we've established, this is the season of Aaron, and I think the past, uh, the back half of this season, the past couple of episodes, I've been a little bit uh, less less happy with. They've been a little bit less Aaron friendly, but I think that ultimately this episode, um, I wanted it to be like for what it was, like it's the return of Scott Bakula or Scott Dracula. Yeah. It uh, introduces Shaw being alive and being back. Um, there's Ellie has a lot to do, which is something we complained about uh, earlier in season three. And with all those pieces, I would have thought that it would be like very memorable, very exciting. But I feel like this was a very set up heavy episode and it's really setting up for that those final two episodes in the finale. And so I think this episode gets a little bit lost as a result. Interesting. <laughs> is this one of your favorites? No, it's not one of my favorites. Okay. I also gave it a very kind of uh, middle of the road score. I okay. gave it a 3.5 okay. out of 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, I agree with everything that you said. I feel like the episode is, it's like working its way out of the funk of the past few episodes, but it's mm-hmm. still not like a great episode, but I enjoyed it, yeah. especially in the third act when we start to deal with the heavier themes like Chuck's mortality, what it means to be a hero, mm-hmm. and of course, Shaw's return from the dead. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm excited to see what happens after this. And it feels a little bit more interesting and relevant than the past few episodes. Obviously glad to see Steven come back because we joke about that a lot of like, where did he go? Yeah. So I think he was in the cabin. He was, he fought the Tic Tac guy, or I guess he didn't really fight him. Casey did that for him, but he was like disposing of his body for him. Yeah. I wonder if it's just like, you can rent this cabin and the people are like, uh yeah, it's available. No one really wants to rent it because a guy died in it. And there then... was a brutal fight and murder of this like old military hero. <laughs> and Steven was like, "Yeah, I, I'm looking for a place that no one is going to be looking for me, and I need yeah. a long term rental. So this sounds great to me. Perfect. Um, yeah. So, that's... so that's uh, Chuck versus the Living Dead slash Dad slash Dracula. Living, living Dead Dad Dracula. That's that's what this episode is. <laughs> Uh, do you have anything left to say, Aaron? Uh, only that, uh, Chris, I, I wish you'd, uh, I wish you'd, now that we're done with this episode, I wish you'd do something with that garlic, because it's coming through the computer. I'm really starting to, I mean, like, I love the scent of garlic, but, I mean, it's a little bit much, even for me. Like, maybe, like, you can throw it away if it's bad, maybe you could go make a pizza, like, several pizzas. What, what else takes garlic? Like, um, like some mashed potatoes? Like, something good. I yeah, know, whip, it, whip it up with some pine nuts. You can even like if you roast it, you could even eat some garlic like on its own. It can be good. What part of me saying at the beginning of the episode that I'm basically allergic to garlic? Did you oh, not you're understand? Right. I'm Aaron? sorry, I forgot you said that. I cannot. That. Wait a second. Oh my god. I, I I'm allergic to garlic. I can't stand garlic. It's bad for me. Is this oh wait, now that I'm thinking about it, I did see Scott Bakula the other day when I was walking down the street and I said, Scott Bakula, you're from Chuck. You're you play Chuck's dad. And he's like, Yeah. And he said, I have to I have to tell you a secret. Come in close. And I said, what's that? And so I, I leaned in and then he bit me on the Chris, neck. Chris. Oh no. Why why are your blinds closed? Is there is there an issue with the sun right now? Yeah, it's just I, I get really hot when the sun's out and like my skin gets all rashy when the sunlight. Oh my god, it. Chris! Your teeth! Oh, oh! Oh my god! Chris has vamp- fangs! I've been a vampire this whole time! Oh my god, Chris, where did you go? I can't see you! The camera's not picking you up anymore! Sorry, I just turned into a bat. <laughs> oh my god! That was so scary. Well, at least I, uh... Oh, shit. I invited Scott Dracula into my home! I'm next! Uh, <laughs> this episode has just been batty, hasn't it? Reminding you that food is sexy. My name is Chris Gillespie. My name is Aaron Draculata. Reminding you that anything is possible. This is just what the show is now. For the rest of the series, we are going to be vampires. We're vampires, baby. What we do in the shadows, season three, is us making a podcast. That's what it is. What a natural ending to the show. (laughs) Bye-bye. See you next week.
Thanks for listening. As always, a big thanks to the artist Hadakoa and the fine folks at freemusicarchive.org for providing us with our theme song, Warm Up. If you want to drop us a line, you can reach us at gocheckyourselfpodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Go Check Yourself on your preferred podcast platform. New episodes come out every Monday morning and you do not want to miss a new episode. Thanks again. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.